The Ardennes, 1944. Throughout November 1944, Eisenhower continued his efforts to close with the Rhine on the broad front. The 80-mile Ardennes sector was thinly held by the US 8th Corps, consisting of two veteran divisions, two fledgling divisions and an experienced armored division. Bradley later described this as a calculated risk. In fact, elite intelligence with regard to German intentions and resources was surprisingly bad. It was accepted that the Germans lacked fuel for an offensive and that von Rundstedt was unlikely to consider the narrow, winding roads and involved country of the Ardennes in the mist and snow of winter as a promising line of advance. As early as the first week of November, however, Hitler had decided to stake everything on a counter-offensive here to restore German morale and give him the respite he needed to transfer reserves later to the Russian front. He hoped us to secure a negotiated peace or win time to put his new weapons into action. The plan aimed at the capture of Antwerp and the destruction of the elite armies north of the Ardennes. It was to be carried out by the strategic reserve, the 5th and the 6th SS Panzer armies. On the right, the 6th SS Panzer army under Sepp Dietrich, consisting of 4 Panzer and 5 infantry divisions, was to cross the Moise on either side of Liege and make for Antwerp. On the left, the 5th Panzer Army under von Manteuffel, crossing the Moise between west of Liege and Namur, was to head for Brussels. The 7th Army was to protect the southern flank. The infantry divisions with heavy artillery support were to make the initial attack. The armor was then to drive through, heading due west without a pause straight for the Moise. Strongly held villages and defensive positions were to be bypassed. The plan included two further novel features. The dropping of a parachute unit to block the roads north of the Ardennes and scores and its force, equipped with captured American vehicles and including English-speaking volunteers in American uniform, which was to pass through the advance guards and seize the moist bridges. The preparations were carried out in extreme secrecy. The assaulting divisions were assembled behind the Aachen front to create the impression that they were to be fed into the battle there. Headquarters were given deceptive signs. Panzer officers were even dressed as infantry. Night fighters were flown overhead to drown the noise of the move up of the artillery. Newly arrived divisions were marched north and east in daylight and then doubled back on their tracks at night. Non-German soldiers were evacuated from the front line. Full advantage was taken of the long hours of darkness. The Germans waited for a period of bad weather. Low cloud on 12 December and for the next week hampered Allied air reconnaissance. Then at 5.30 hours on 16 December, 14 infantry divisions supported by 2,000 guns advanced through the mist against the thinly held American line. In the extreme north, between Monschau and Budgenbach, the 6th SS Panzer Army struck firm resistance by two divisions of the US 5th Corps. Dietrich, selected to command on account of his bravery and loyalty to Hitler, soon found himself faced by a task beyond his ability. One of his armored groups, however, Task Force Piper, nearly got through to the big American petrol dump at Stadelt. It was south of Budgenbach, where the collapse occurred. Here, von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army swamped the widely extended US 28th and 106th Divisions, and moving on that night by the light of searchlights, continued the breakthrough. American confusion was immediate and impressive. Late on the 16th, Eisenhower and Bradley had only received fragmentary reports. Bradley considered it a spoiling attack designed to forestall Patton's offensive in the south. Eisenhower took a more realistic view and ordered the 7th US Armored Division from the 9th Army in the north and the 11th US Armored Division from the south into the Ardennes. That night, German paratroopers landing near Spa produced something like a paralysis behind the American lines. Late on the 17th December, 
the 7th U.S. Armored Division, under Brigadier General Hasbrook, occupied the important road junction at Sandwith. Here it blocked Dietrich till the 23rd. It was not till the evening of the 17th that Eisenhower ordered forward the celebrated 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions from his theater reserve. By this time, von Manteuffel's three leading Panzer divisions were within 15 miles of the key road center of Bastogne. The first American troops to reach this place were a battle group of the 10th U.S. Armored Division on the evening of the 18th. The 101st Airborne Division, in a lightning move of 100 miles by road, arrived there during the night. At the dawn on the 19th, by airline, with Panzer Lair, found Bastogne strongly held. Von Manteuffel therefore decided to encircle the place and continue the drive to the Moise. With Dietrich halted and von Manteuffel with the ball at his feet, Model now proposed to reinforce the latter with Dietrich's two uncommitted panzer divisions. Hitler would not agree. He wished the decisive blow to be struck by the SS divisions on Dietrich's front and not by Wehrmacht under von Manteuffel. Meanwhile, Montgomery, thoroughly informed of the situation by his liaison officers, had on his own initiative switched his 13th Corps to the west bank of the Moise between Liège and Namur. Here, with the three battle-hardened divisions, one armored division and three armored brigades, admirable letter communications and the best tank going in Belgium, he viewed the prospect of a German eruption over the Moise with an equanimity which his American colleagues did not share. At his headquarters at Luxembourg, Bradley was completely out of touch with the situation. It was left to Eisenhower to rise to the level of events. Meeting Bradley, Patton and Devers at Verdun on the 19th, he placed all American troops north of the line Givet Hofaris Prum under Montgomery's command and ordered Patton to swing his army north towards Bastogne. Patton's drive got going on the 22nd. On the following day, the spearhead of the 5th Panzer Army got to within 4 miles of the Moise near Sels. The sky now cleared and the Allied air forces were once again able to intervene. Immobilized by lack of petrol, the Germans failed to make further progress. Here the battle ended on the 26th December when the US 2nd Armored Division crashed the 2nd Panzer Division at Sels. Late on the same day, Patton's 4th Armored Division punched a narrow corridor into Bastogne. Throughout the next week, the Germans made an all-out effort to take Bastogne and its corridor, but Patton, trusting in newly arrived divisions straight into battle and aided by the 19th Tactical Air Force under abominable flying conditions, held his ground. In the north, Montgomery proceeded to tidy up the front and restore balance. Despite American objections by evacuating the Sandwich salient, and withdrawing the US 7th Corps into reserve to reorganize for the counteroffensive. This went in on 3rd January. By this time, much of the 6th SS Panzer Army strength had been dissipated at Bastogne. Driving through bitter German opposition, storms, and waist deep snow, the US 7th Corps cut the vital La Roche Vielsam road on the 7th. Next day, Hitler, no longer able to deny that most of his surviving armor was in danger, of being trapped between Montgomery's and Patton Trusts, authorized Model to give up the area west of Hufalis. The Germans waged a fighting retreat, but on the 16th January the US 2nd and 11th Armored Divisions linked up at Hufalis and re-established a solid front. It was not till the end of January, however, that the last Germans were driven out of the Ardennes. Unquestionably, Eisenhower's decision at the crisis to place the Northern armies under Montgomery and to send the 101st Airborne Divisions to Bastogne saved the day. In abandoning the Sandwich salient and creating a reserve before turning to the counteroffensive, Montgomery showed a grasp of the situation superior to that of his American colleagues. Time was needed to regroup, reorganize and make the necessary administrative preparation. Once the skies cleared and the air arm could come into its own, the issue was never in doubt.